Royce and Adiz Deck. Welcome to day 10. Um, we are on day 10 of the festival after a lovely relaxing um, Sunday off where we just had a film viewing and um, we watched The Girl. Um, we, yeah, I'll link down below if you'd like to watch it. Um, so after a lovely Sunday off, um, we have returned for our second Welsh day. Um, a second being the first was last year. Um, the Welsh day is sort of an integral part of the festival um, given that we are a Welsh festival and um, you know we're sort of uh, looking at translation so how can we not look at translation in the very place that we are set. Um, so today I'm really excited to first of all introduce Mena Elvin. For those of you who haven't come across Mena Elvin before she is in so many ways. Can you hear that? Those of you who haven't come across Mena before, um, she is the beating heartbeat of the Welsh poetry and Welsh literature community in general. She has been working tirelessly, I mean I'm sure not tirelessly, I'm sure with like with incredible effort. Um, she has been working so hard for decades um, to help support and promote Welsh language literature um, and she's the best. <laughs> she's the actual best. Sorry there are so many creepy callies in here, we just had the bees. There's a huge freaking spider somewhere there and something just fell off. Right. Zen. Mena. Then we have Christine Watkins, um, who is a storyteller, and in particular she comes and talks to us about Gwent Folk Tales, um, her book of folk tales from the region in which I um, live and which in the festival is um, built and situated um, and where I grew up. So um, these folk tales, um, some of them were in English, some of them were in Welsh. She's sort of collated, so she's used her um, skills, language skills and her incredible storytelling skills to find those, to choose those and to preserve those. And I think that, um, you know, Will and I are in quite a agreement about this talk that actually um, she and Christine and other people who do similar work of preserving local folk tales um, are um, unsung heroes. <laughs> Sorry that spider is so big! <laughs> our unsung heroes and are fantastic. Nothing like a bit of Welsh nature for Welsh Day. Um, then we have um, <laughs> we have um, Carol Lewis and Gwen Davies, um, who are the, uh, Carol Lewis is the Welsh language author, the Cymraeg author of um, um, Igmaid and Martha Jackashanko, and um, Gwen Davies is the translator um, of um, the jeweller. <laughs> and Martha Jack and Shanko um, and um, so we talk a little bit about those I'm back but the spider's not moving anymore it's right there so we're all fine um, and second third I believe I got in Christine just about um, and then after Christine we have Carol Lewis and Gwen Davies I think I started talking about that um, so Carol got sort of this one book Martha Jack and Janko um, was incredibly successful and it is um, quite rightly was incredibly successful it is a little stunner of a book it is a um, horror filled gem it's so creepy and it's so unexpectedly so creepy because it's you know it's very simple premises there's nothing sort of in it that makes you go oh yeah this is going to be terrifying like until you're in it and it's like oh my god this is terrifying um and it's also whilst that i think a thing i really admire about it and about her other book as well is that they're both these acts of self-liberation really um in them these women make these choices that you don't necessarily understand you're like what like this makes no sense and then you see as it unfolds you see why this is the choice that makes sense for them why actually this is them achieving their own self-liberation freedom um and you know they're making their own choices despite whether they're the choices you would make or not um i think both tales are um wonderful for that really fantastic and um yeah i really really enjoyed this conversation um and yeah certainly if you want to 
<laughs> if you want a little hint of, um, if you want a little hint of um, sort of Welsh horror, it's the one to go for. Um, then, then um, this evening we have Tishani Doshi. Um, who is a Welsh Gujarati writer um, and she has written two books of poetry that's what we focus on she's done many other things as well many fiction books and then also um, is a dancer and like some multidisciplinary artist um, and um, so um, but we talk about her poetry and we talk about how empathetic it is and how she um, goes above and beyond to use specifics of the moment to talk about more general sort of themes and um she's just a lovely lovely human and i really enjoyed speaking to her so that's the last part of this lovely welsh day um a uh, <laughs> truncated intro <laughs> um uh, but um you know realistic realistic to um the nature of wales um, and the, uh, where is that spider? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, welcome to Welsh Day, enjoy these clips, and I will see you all later. Goodbye! Well, I finished with my latest book, um, Bondo. Uh, I won't say last book, I hope, latest book, because I'm bringing out a book of Welsh language poetry next, called Tostery Thed, which means mercies. Uh, next year and but uh bondo i love the idea of bonding which is what poetry tries to do it's also in welsh it means the ease of a house it's also uh, a people in northern eastern india the bondo people bonda they speak a language which i hoped to have gone there but i didn't it's also a kind of polyfiller so it's kind of all about bonding. And so I'll finish with this poem. I launched this in Italian last week. It's coming out in Spanish next month. Uh, it will appear probably with a selected poems from Macedonian uh, soon. So translation happens without me, which is wonderful. Uh, and it can leave me and reach other places. So I'll finish with Bondo, benediction of these translated by Damien Warford Davis. So I'll read the English first and I'll finish with the Welsh. Um, and it's got one rhyme in Welsh right through. Benediction of Eves, blessings to all paired things they shield. Snug and the soffits we sing, blessed be, the tabernacles of our eaves. What more delicious than under overhangs to sleep and an alarmed wake to our abate before the day drafts itself, disperses us, but only till we roost again in the grace and godsend of the eaves. After the mass migration song spill from summer gables, Flights flurry settle, fledgings hallow, our own sweet brood indoors, boon of ease born birds. Each day ends triumphant in a coming home, but home we know is where we leave from. Hatchlings raise the latch and go. Let's fly blessings, may your eaves lease always bring you joy. Bend it. What an abondo, do you then see Scorsia, a grando, a tenio, bonblin, keed, bunkio, then I clead him a chrono, a maul are with a sayano, bendeth, you be the bondo. Pavid gwell, a gaman he no, he bon, gerlau or thefro, gwen camara raul, briginio, kinir di thy waul, vraslinio, and guasca. He dour and cluido y vende o dan y bondo. Oes o ŵyl yw noswylio. Pa bris i ddyn llys breswylio. I bod cyw daw gwawr e hyd o rhaid ar ei hynt. Anturio. Can ein pader yw plith fel heno. Ein pryder boed iddo esmwytho. Boed bendith ar nith 
Aipon Dom. Jochagard. Jochagard stories don't really know boundaries the whole thing of stories is that they do travel they don't know boundaries any more than a river does really a river may become a boundary but it you know I think so there are stories which you see there are there are themes and motifs in folk tales if you read if you've, you're exposed to enough of them so there are there are themes in that you'll find in Herefordshire folk tales that you'll find in Monmouthshire that you may find in I don't know Gloucestershire you'll find various versions of the, of the same tale just given a local uh, a local um, geography for the telling of it so there are those and there are other ones that <clears throat> there are other ones that um, feel more particular for different reasons. The one about the Japan house, even though that was part of it, looking at the Japaning industry as part of a whole cosmic, well, part of the Industrial Revolution, really, a small little bit of it. It's very specific and it's something I grow, grew up knowing, knowing about. And it felt as if it, that story belonged there, even though a lot of the protagonists in the story actually had come in from England to work in the in the industry. And then, of course, there's the ones like um, the very the very oldest ones, which the, the story which opens and closes the book. Um, there are twenty nine stories in all, and the one which opens the book, which is the story of which, which um, is in the Old Welsh triads, it's first written down. So it's written down in early medieval sources, but it's probably very, very old, pre, you know, an, an, in oral history, um, long predating writing, which is the story of how, it's, it's like a mini, um, a mini fertility creation story in a way. It's a story of how Hen when the sow brought fertility to Wales and the first place she lands, I was delighted to find out was Monmouthshire. So she became the opening of the Monmouthshire story. So that's bringing in themes of, of um, animal, animal totems and, and the fertility of the land because she gives birth to a bee and to a grain of wheat. And thus, you know, before she goes, travels off through the west, rest of Wales. So um, she does that on the flat plains, having come in from the sea on the, on the coast in the Port, Port Stewart area. And then at the end of the book, there's also, I've also put that almost a slightly the reverse journey. And that's a, that's a Mabinogi story. And it's from Kiloch and Olwen, just a little bit of what is a very long, uproarious story that would have originally been in the oral tradition and is certainly predates the Mabinogi itself. And that, actually, that's interesting because in this context, because the bit of the story that I, I chose to end the book with is, um, the story of how um, in Kiloch and Olwen, the, the tale is that they have to, they have to, they, they have to arrange a marriage between Kiloch and Olwen, the giant's daughter. And they have to do loads of fantastical feats, which are pretty much impossible. And they kind of go through all these feats. One of the things they've got to do is they've got to catch this boar, magical boar. And to do that, they need to find Mabon, son of Modron, who is missing. So they all get together. So he's the only one who can really, really do the boar hunt. So they all get together and they decide that the, nobody knows where, Ma, where Mabon is. And the only way they can find out is they decide by asking the oldest animals uh, for some clues as to where to find it. But they can't talk to the oldest animals because they, they can't speak to them. So they decide to recruit a member to their team who is called Gurhir Gwalstaud Yeithoith, which means Gurhir, the master of languages. And he also happens to be master of bird and animal languages. So with him on the team as translator, they kind of set off and they go through several of the oldest animals and they find out that they're not the actual oldest and there's always an older one somewhere else. And then they end up, of course, in, in Southeast Wales, where some of the best stories begin and end. And um, they're able, they're, they're signposted by the ancient eagle to the salmon who rides up on the seven boar the ancient salmon of Llinllyw. And he is the oldest living creature. And luckily their translator can also speak salmon. So as well as being able to speak blackbird and owl and eagle and stag, he can speak salmon. So they ride up on the back of the salmon and the salmon says, I know that Mabon's been held in prison in Gloucester because I've heard him calling. And lo and behold, they 
they ride up on the salmon's back on the boar and they bust Mabon out of jail in Gloucester. And um, yeah, and then they go off and they hunt the boar. So yes, so that, but it was sometimes very handy to have a translator with you, you know. Mm, absolutely. Everyone should have a translator with them. Yeah. I saw these uh, types of characters, these types of communities around me, but I, I didn't necessarily see them in literature. Um, and I felt that there was a, a great um, rush towards a, a new version of Wales, a new um, a modern Wales, without actually any discussion of what we were going to do with an older version of Wales. And, and uh, there's a tradition in, in Wales of Maurnad, um, the, the old poets used to um, create poems to mark the passing of people. And in some ways, Martha Jakushanko is a Maurnad to a way of life, um, a particular culture that's so linked with um, landscape and also linguistically linked to landscape and the stories around that landscape. And the way I explain it, I, I, always, I used to work in the tourist office in Aberystwyth and we used to sell these postcards of the mountains around here. And tourists used to come and say, gosh, you know, aren't they empty? And for me, I just couldn't see the emptiness. It was always this fullness of language, of character, of story, of history. And it was just trying to get that across. And, and again, with the Gemid, um, the sea's always been important to me. I grew up um, in Abriron, um, which is a town by the sea. Um, I worked in the tourist office there in my <laughs> when I was younger as well. And, um, you know, I, I used to get there early in the morning and Dan Fish would bring the fish in on the harbour. And it, it was just this rhythm of life before before everyone else woke up. It was just intrinsically about the place um, and the stories that we used to talk about. Um, you know, as, so the sea has always been um, a central emblem for me as well of cultures that are pushed to the edge. We are literally on the edge here in Aberystwyth, you can't go further west. Um, and there's always that teetering um, that makes the culture so vulnerable, but yet so alive. Um, so these are the reasons that I kind of, I'm always drawn to these kinds of landscapes. So my experience was uh, diff it's different from Carol's because I grew up in West Yorkshire to, in, within a Welsh speaking family. Um, and I, for me, that there's an element of language being a bit of a performance in a way that it, you could switch on a different identity in speaking another language. Because my dad also spoke Spanish. I could hear him talking on the phone because he taught Spanish at Leeds University. And, he like have a different, I loved it. It was like, he was a lot more, he was quite gregarious anyway. There's all this different kind of cadence and uh, expressions and laughing and it's, you know, I thought, oh, what's happening? <laughs> I love that. And I really love, I mean, it's a bit odd maybe, I just really love to hear people speaking other languages that I love it if they hear Polish spoken and, um, is that the sort of that sense of, and then for me, because, you know, nobody really knew, sometimes the teachers would say, oh, Gwen's Welsh and saying stuff like that, but then nobody really knew that we spoke Welsh and it's like this hidden thing. Um, so like you say, sometimes, sometimes that's nice, but then for you, Carol, maybe you, you're talking about not hiding yourself anymore you know that you know that you're this really really good writer and you want the world to know so I think this is <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that <laughs> I think that's going a bit far <laughs> I think you hide you know I suppose anybody who speaks more than one language you, you probably say the same if you're talking to somebody from an Asian background perhaps who lives in Bradford somebody like that they'd be speaking different languages at home they'll be helping the, the older generation interpret um, when they're out in the shopping or whatever in, in, in the world. So there's this lovely element uh, about language that it's performance element, it's to do with identity, 
um, and it can be a hidden thing, but sometimes if you don't want to hide. You know, because I, um, I worked as a dancer and I still think of myself as a dancer, even though I haven't performed um, in over a year and I haven't danced in over a year. Um, it's been such a big part of my life and the body is just the place where I begin. It's, it's the most central thing available to me. And I think it's always this sense of finding one's center and finding oneself because you keep losing yourself along the way. And it feels to me that the better you know your body, the better you might know yourself. And I feel that we're estranged in some ways and we have to make an effort. And like you said, there are so many social, cultural, uh, so much conditioning and so much policing going around uh, around the uh, the notion of bodies and, and not just female bodies, all bodies, you know. Uh, so there's so much shame attached to the idea of body, so much fear attached to the idea of body. And I suppose part of me, because I've used the, because I've used the, one second, sorry. sorry. I'm doing an interview. Sorry about that, that was my mom asking about tea. <laughs> Um, Sorry, uh, just a bit of slice in real life in, in between uh, yeah I think that that sense of joy of body or um, celebration of body and how we can find that and how that can bring us to other things of the world so that's really important but I also don't want to just glorify the body as this thing that doesn't have any pain connected to it so you know um, that sense of the body that's aging the body that's decaying all of these things are, are part of life and I think that they they necessarily become part of the poems because the work as a dancer has been so much about the mystery of the body and trying to understand it and and appreciating and in even some sense worshiping the idea of what the body can, what the human body can actually do, and what it does for us daily, without us even knowing um, all the all the invisible things that that go on inside. <laughs>